Welcome to AP World Simplified. Today we're going to be discussing the religions, trade, and migration patterns of the late foundational era. Now the earlier religions carrying over from the Paleolithic era, they were more so meant to explain uh, how the world worked and perhaps codify some sort of ethic that these groups of people uh, were living by, this, this way that they were living their lives. Now they didn't have the scientific tools, uh, analysis, that we have nowadays. However, they were able to try to, of course, explain the world in terms that they could understand. Now, the first three general religious practices that took place were in the form of animism, shamanism, and ancestral veneration. Now, animism is actually where people are going to worship inanimate objects. So this is the sort of thing you think of when people are worshiping the sun or volcanoes or making sacrifices to those things. Uh, that would be a form of animism, giving those human qualities to inanimate objects. Shamanism, on the other hand, is a connection through one or multiple spiritual leaders in your tribe or group uh, that have some sort of uh, spiritual connection, be it uh, they can see the future, they can harness some sort of mystical power or healing powers or herbal medication. Those are the types of things you would generally consider a more shamanistic uh, belief code. Uh, and ancestral veneration is going to be particularly popular in East Asia. That is where one venerates or worships or celebrates their ancestors in the hopes of that that respect and um, that sort of worshiping would result in their ancestors blessing them going forward. And if they don't do those things, they neglect their ancestors, they either won't receive the blessing or aid of those ancestors, or perhaps those ancestors may work against them. Now, almost all of these religions are going to be polytheistic, meaning they worship many gods or many deities. One of the first religions to break away from that tradition that would be known as Zoroastrianism, starting in roughly the second millennia BCE. This came out of what is going to become Persia, uh, or modern day Iran. And this really, really changed a lot of the core beliefs that many of these polythe polytheistic and primitive religions uh, practiced. Uh, first and foremost, Zoroastrianism is going to focus around a monotheistic uh, belief, or a belief in one single god, one divine being. Furthermore, Zoroastrianism is going to believe that this one god has created the universe, and that there is this sort of constant battle between good and evil across the world and greater universe. And in that battle between good and evil, there are humans who have the choice or the free will to choose to live their lives more towards the good or more towards the evil. And of course, Zoroastrianism was one of the first to lay out a concrete afterlife in that they believed if you led your life mostly for the bad, you would end up in a place of eternal torment or hell. If you led your life for the most part in the towards the cause of the good, you would be rewarded with eternal paradise uh, or heaven. And all of these are fundamental concepts that had not been thought of before, be it monotheism, uh, good versus evil, the free will to choose uh, who you, which side you're living towards, punishment uh, eternally, uh, in the case of the good and the bad. Uh, and also, they're the first to come up with this concept of a messiah, some person that we born or come later into the humanity, into humanity and they would shift the battle in the favor of the good. These five fundamental beliefs are gonna profoundly influence later Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which today make up some of the biggest religions uh, in the entire world. Speaking of which, Judaism is a belief that comes from the people of Israel or the Hebrew people. Uh, while, it used, while it originated roughly 3,000 years ago with the Hebrew scriptures, it was mostly a polytheistic and very Mediterranean uh, type religion. It had a God that was uh, somewhat temperamental, um, angry, and and jealous and all these various human emotions. However, that sort of tone is going to take a shift later after what we call Second Temple Judaism. But before I explain to you Second Temple Judaism, let me tell you about the Jewish people. The Jewish people have been displaced from their state of Israel several times throughout history. Excluding their slavery stint in Egypt, they were also displaced from Israel by the Assyrians, Babylonians, and later Romans. Now, while they did not have a, a Jewish state to identify with, their form of identity came with maintaining their culture, their language, and their religion, which was Judaism. Now, most people at the time, when they were conquered by a surrounding city-state or empire, they generally chose to or were forced to give up their religion in favor of the clearly superior other civilizations, uh, god or gods. The Jewish people, however, would hold on to that, and that would really cause them a lot of uh, anguish as they were persecuted by many of these groups that would take over them and they would force to be forced to either leave uh, or they would uh, be persecuted for not converting to the, the new religion. This would change, however, after the Persian Empire invaded the Middle East. When they defeated the Babylonians, thus freeing the Jewish people from their exile in Babylon, they allowed the Jewish people to not only go back to their state of Israel, but they allowed them to keep their religion without any sort of influence or forcing of Zoroastrianism upon them. Whether or not that contributed to the mixing of the two, 
Judaism would syncretize heavily with the Zoroastrian core beliefs of not only a monotheistic uh, single god, but also the concept of good and evil, free will, heaven and hell, as well as a later coming Messiah. Not only that, but Judaism itself would re result in Christianity breaking off from it, as well as Islam, uh, and both taking a lot of these core fundamentals along with them, uh, which of course today we see all over the world with uh, well over a billion Christians uh, and Islamic people uh, throughout the world. Another major religion established at the time would be known as the Vedic beliefs before they were later codified and made into what is now known as Hinduism. Now these beliefs were largely spread by a group of people referred to as the Indo-European or Aryans who began a migration from the Central Asian steppes, they were pastoralists, uh, throughout Europe, the Middle East, what is now modern day Persia or modern day Iran, uh, and India. And with them, particularly into the Indian subcontinent, they're going to take with them their oral traditions uh, known as the Vedic beliefs. Now these beliefs are going to syncretize or mix with the local people of the uh, Indus Valley and the rest of the Indian subcontinent. And they're going to later form, uh, as I mentioned before, being codified by the Sanskrit Vedas uh, and Upanishads uh, and forming Hinduism, they're going to blend together to form and enforce this existing caste system, which I'll explain later uh, when we talk about Hinduism as a whole. Along with these Vedic beliefs, these Aryans also spread um, their language, which is why if you look at the root languages for most of the uh, peoples of Europe, um, even into the Middle East, Iran, Central Asia, and India, you will see the root languages is Indo-European. And that's because of these uh, core invaders that came from roughly the Caucasus mountain regions. Uh, and they're going to spread not only their technology, culture, and religion, but their language as well. Another major migration taking place at around 1000 BCE is known as the Bantu migration. Now the Bantu people came from West Africa, most likely around the Niger River Valley, where they first harnessed agriculture. Uh, they also harnessed and developed uh, iron tools and, and iron making, and that gave them a massive advantage uh, versus the other people uh, that were south of the Saharan Desert, which at the time still cut off Sub-Saharan uh, Africa from Afro, North Africa, uh, Asia, and Europe. Now, when these people expanded, they had a massive advantage over the somewhat pastoral slash nomadic people that inhabited East and South Africa with their agriculture, uh, iron making, um, and other advantages. And they're going to relatively easily spread out first to East Africa and then down further to South Africa. Now, while there's not a whole lot of genealogical evidence for to support this Bantu migration, there's a very clear linguistic set of um, proof as most of these languages can be rooted back to this Bantu uh, language that goes into West Africa. Now a lot of these migrations and religions were able to spread because of increased amounts of trade towards the later half of the foundational era. One of the first Long distance, consistent interregional trade is going to take place between the Nile River Valley of Egypt and the Mesopotamian uh, civilizations and empires of Mesopotamia. Uh, this is going to start off by land, as that is obviously the easier of the two to develop, as sea trade is not going to develop until the Indus Valley starts around 2300 BCE. However, what I need to mention here is the fact that trade is going to be centered around the trade of luxury goods. They're not going to risk their lives and their go on these long expensive trips to trade basic things they already have, they're trading for things that they uh, either don't have available to them as a resource or are crafted and manufactured specifically in these various regions. That could include gold, silver, various clothes, uh, later on silk, um, and other luxury goods uh, that people are willing to risk their lives for and profit from highly by trading between these two regions. Now the first connection by sea, as I mentioned, is by the Indus Valley River civilizations. Around 2300 BC, they're going to make a uh, maritime connection with the peoples of Mesopotamia. Now, these Indus Valley traders are actually there to stay. Uh, their trade, the trade that they establish is so successful that many of the people from the Indus Valley actually stay in Mesopotamia, intermarrying and acting as translators and merchants that become a part of the language and gene pool of the peoples of Mesopotamia. And finally, the last topic of the late foundational era is going to be the cultural exchange that took place between Egypt and Nubia. Now, Egypt was downstream of Nubia, although they were actually further north. Um, the Nubians are going to make this connection with the Egyptians, and at the time, the Egyptians were pretty far ahead as far as architecture, mathematics, society goes, than almost any other civilization in the world. As such, when the Nubians establish this trade uh, connection between the Egyptians and themselves, they're going to borrow heavily from Egyptian culture. Uh, what I mean by that is they're going to adopt a lot of the qualities of the Egyptian deities and gods. They're going to um, copy a lot of their dress, and both sides are 
are going to uh, sh share goods and ideas as well. Now, while places like Egypt, Nubia, Mesopotamia, and in the Indus Valley had established some long distance trade, nobody had consistently established uh, these long distance trade networks that are going to develop in the classical era, which will be my next video series. And while that's it for this episode of AP World Simplified, be sure to check out my website at morganapteaching.com. If you're looking for materials as an AP World student or an AP World teacher to help yourself out along the way. Thanks for watching.